Hello then. So, today, what are we doing? Well, I've got this MMC adapter that I've had for years that has a little MMC card in it that pretends to be kind of like a floppy drive, but it has a different ROM chip inside it. And I'm going to replace it with a GoTech so that I have a slightly easier way of getting data in and out of this thing. Um, this uses its own special piece of software and it's not even an SD card. It's like a really old MMC card and it's just kind of annoying to use. I've also found a Raspberry Pi Zero and I've got this little board that will let me attach it inside the BBC as if it was a second coprocessor. So we can have a mess around with that. And on the screen is absolutely nothing. There we go. So if I list the disc that this thinks it is, it's got Chucky Egg on it. But you can see I've got other ones on, so if I remember how to do this. This keeps appearing, which is quite irritating. That's my little SCART box that I was trying to use for video capture and it doesn't work. Um, let's have a look at my code. I think it's star D in 40. Start out. Um, okay. What's this? There's a delete key. Yeah. Okay. No. Oh, it's the original, original one. The one that I created. Uh -huh. This is the original one from when I was doing the Z80 version. I typed this version in. I can't remember how to play this. Q button's stuck. So yeah. Since I've bought this GoTech drive, I should probably see if this works to begin with. It just plugs straight into the floppy drive connector with a power, and that's it. So let's do that first. So if you've never seen underneath the BBC Macro, it looks like this. It's got power connector for disk drives. That's where the disk drive connects. It's got a printer. It's got a user port, which is what this box is attached to. And then it's got two connectors here for the bus. Um, this with the Raspberry Pi, it's going to go in there, or maybe like that with a cable. Oh no, actually it goes in the tube port, in there. And then the GoTech is going to go in here. So before I attach the GoTech, I need to swap out a ROM chip. I've got this DFS ROM chip that I took out originally. This is what makes floppy drives work. And when I got the MMC one, it came with its own ROM chip that replaced it. So if you look down here, there's one that says MMC, and I need to pull that out and put the DFS chip in instead. They can sort of go together, but the machine and I definitely get confused with which one is which. So all I need to do is very carefully flick it across the desk, because that's always good for chips. Let's just put that there. And... Check it's been in the right way up. Right. Let's get this GoTech drive and attach this. It's quite nice, isn't it? So attaching all this stuff is dead easy. This is the power connector. And this just goes on here. And it can only go one way up which is that way. There we go. And then we flip it back over. Sort out all these cables. Yeah, this is a thing with the BBC. They have lots of ribbon cables poking out of them and it's quite hard working out where they should go. So if I just gently fold that, it can slip out the side and this can sit on the top 
That'll do. Now, what I got with it was this little mysterious package, which inside it should contain a USB stick. Anti-static bag to keep your USB thumb drive safe. Oh, okay, so 16 gig sand disk drive, that's not bad. Put you in there. Right then, so let's power this up. This is the first time I've done this. Hopefully it should just come on and say like Acorn DFS or something. So here we go. There we are, Acorn DFS. And on here, if you can see it, can you see it? Just there, it says Elite. If I turn the little thing, I can change what the, well, it says like what to do with the disk image. So exit to selector, exit and reinsert, eject menu. Well, let's just do that. Not doing anything? No. Right, we've inserted it. Hmm. Do some more fussing around with this. Not that time I have to read the manual. Connect it to the disk drive connector. Yes, I've done that. Should we? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right, we're going to try something. As far as I can tell, the MMC ROM is just a hacked version of the DFS, so maybe this will work. Right, let's see what happens now. No, not doing anything. It's just sat there doing nothing. Right, after a bit of fussing around and cleaning the floppy drive chip with some contact cleaner and then prying out the DFS ROM, dropping it on the floor and bending on its legs because, you know, these little grabbers are a little bit forceful. I cleaned its contacts and then I flipped the machine over and shot some of this up the floppy drive connector. And that seems to have sorted it out because as you can see on the screen, it's loaded something called Edu2 and I found something called Sum Vaders. Oh wow, look at this. Okay, um, 10 plus 10 equals 20. All oh, right, I see. One plus one. Uh, uh, three. Guess it's not three. Five plus ten. Okay, this is about as exciting as I expected. Uh oh, what's going on here? Yes, escape. Right, let's try something else. So that's single sided. Let's try a double sided disk. Do they work? So I drew three dash one. Let's go for some ooh spatial coordinates. They sound fancy. They're not. Um, let's do the maze. 
It's a BBC Micro. We have to do educational things on it. I'm feeling like I want to do four. Use arrows to move the man through the maze. Oh, well. oh, these arrow keys are a bit difficult. This is not a difficult maze. Okay, yeah. Oh, they've made it so you can't break out of it. This is definitely aimed for like being put in a classroom and you stick the kids in front of it. And no matter what they press, they can't break out of it. Okay. And I guess that beep, you'd soon know if a kid was messing with it. Right, let's try a different one. So it's got the 6502 version. Once I get this working with the Raspberry Pi, I'll be able to play that, and that'll be a test of if it's working. This complete monster is an original BBC Micro 40-track, single-sided, 100K floppy drive. And we're going to be using this to give the GoTech somewhere to live, using a little bracket that I stole out my PC. Um, I have a memory card reader that used to live in this and now I've just taken this out because I'm impatient and I don't want to wait for one to come off eBay. So the GoTech will go in the thing, the thing will go in there, plug that into the computer. So step one, you need to open this, which I've taken the screws out already. This is incredibly solid. Right. This is the floppy drive itself. And it's made from some of the thickest metal that I've seen. This is like proper solid. If I had something magnetic, but find out what this is. It's either aluminium or some sort of steel or something, but it's incredibly heavy. It weighs more than the case. And it's all piddly single-sided floppy drive. But look, it still uses the same connectors that PCs use. So this would technically plug into a PC. It's got the same power connector and everything. It's just where the PC would understand a 40 track single sided disk drive. So we don't need this bit, but I'm not going to bin it or do anything nasty to it. I'll just keep it in a box, keep it safe. You know, I can't remember if it works, but there we go. So all I need is a bunch of screws. Okay, these are the wrong screws. So there's holes here that clearly go there, but this doesn't have anything on them. Oh, 
I guess it's where the disk drive was actually screwed into the case and it didn't use the side ones. Uh, okay. Let's see how we can convince this to work. Right, I have a cunning plan involving fire and a pair of tweezers. So, yeah. And here it is, here's the GoTech all nicely installed inside the case that I found. I managed to make the screws fit. There's the little screen, and I'll just show you what it looks like. You can also try and record some of the sounds that it makes. So if I select a disc, I don't know what ADV03 is, but it's a double-sided disc. So if I select it, it's now as if I put the disc in. And if I would clip my microphone to this. So now you'll be able to hear some fake floppy sounds, which are quite cool. Um, let's pick, I don't know, Mystery Lost Cheap. Yeah. Uh, I want part one, I have no idea. So you can hear that whilst it's seeking, it actually plays a sound. So as far as the BBC cares, it's got a new floppy drive inside it, and that's it. It just sort of works. You put um, disk images on the USB stick. You can pull this out, it doesn't really seem to worry. The problem using this, while it was quite convenient, in that this is just a box, I'll open it up in a second, you had to take that out, put it in your PC, and run special software to write an image to this card. You didn't just drag files onto it, so it got a bit difficult to use, especially when you'd not used it for a while and you forgot where the software was or even how it worked. In fact, let me try and get inside this. Uh, there we go. So inside this, you can see it is literally an MMC card reader. And it is an MMC, it's not an SD card. A small, tiny bit of logic just to shift the levels from this to what the BBC wants. And that's it. This plugs straight into the user port, and that's it. Whereas this one, it actually thinks it's a floppy drive. And the really cool bit is, because it's got the original floppy drive connector, I could plug this into an Amiga, or a PC, or an Atari ST, or a Spectrum, or anything else that takes a regular floppy drive. So, if I ever get bored with this on my BBC, I can put it in something else. So, I might use this in the future on a different machine. Right, now that's finished, the next thing to build is this little contraption. And it doesn't take much building, all I need to do is solder some pin headers to this on the Raspberry Pi. I then need to write some software to the memory card and find a 40-way ribbon cable. Now I bought this from Amazon yesterday and it turned up today which is pretty good, but then when I came to start this little bit of project, I discovered I had this in the same bag that this came out of. So I'd obviously bought this and received a cable and then just not looked hard enough in the bag to find the cable and forgot it existed. So I thought I needed to buy a new one. Never mind. This one's got nice rainbow colours. It matches the 80s style of BBCs. I remember being at school and these things would often have like rainbow cables snaking out the back of them going everywhere. So it fits, we'll use this one instead. I'm thinking maybe I could mount this inside. Like these holes here are designed for ribbon cables to come through. So I bet I could put this in here somewhere after covering the back up so it doesn't short out. 
and figure out a way of getting the cable possibly through the front or something but we'll see so first job is to solder this now looking at the pins the Raspberry Pi sits on here and pin one is that one which is there on the Raspberry Pi pin one I'm guessing is that one with the square which means it goes upside down like that which makes quite a nice small compact unit you don't need these ports because it's powered through this connector and there's nothing to look at coming out of the VG, um, HDMI connector so I think I'll get on with doing that first thing I have to move this out of the way which involves unplugging it or putting it somewhere I'm just checking the documentation of how to build the Pi tube adapter and it's on this Retro Clinic website where he's got all the documentation and also the firmware that I'll need later on so if we go into the generic guide it's got this picture here of the Raspberry Pi and you can see that the Pi is upside down attached to the board so that's the way I need to solder it and also quite a nice mounting option there I might be able to do it that way on the inside of the case I'll have a play around see what I can do but there yeah, there's quite a lot of things that I'll need to play with later to set up um, how to use it and different commands to type in. So look, I can emulate a 274 megahertz 65C102 or a 60 megahertz Z80. I want to try the 286 and run DOS because I've seen other people do it, so I think that could be quite fun. And maybe a 60 megahertz Z80, see if it can run some of the code I've done before. The other interesting bit is that you can create your own um, co-processors for it and that might be something fun to play with right then let's turn all this on I've got the Raspberry Pi attached got the floppy drive attached the screen is connected it's plugged in let's turn it on and see what happens well it says BBC computer doesn't say anything else. The only lights on on the Raspberry Pi. Um, that's a no. The Raspberry Pi even got power. Maybe the tube connector is dirty. It's likely there's never been anything plugged into this tube port ever. Try again. Ah, something flashed then. So the Pi is getting power. Have I made the SD card wrong? Because it is definitely supposed to say something on the screen there. Let's read the fine manual. Possibly put the wrong contents on this memory card. Let's put it back in the reader. And try the other one, PyTube Zero. So I'll paste that on. Let's try again. Hmm. I have possibly figured out what was wrong. So I had to take the Raspberry Pi that I had in my Spectrum Next, which is a whole different video, and I noticed that the files on this were named different to the ones on this. So I've renamed some files. Let's see what happens. Uh, oh. No. Still not working. Okay, it's possible this BBC doesn't have the required code. Let's 
play around with some ROMs. Let's put the MMC in it as well. Could be working, it could just be that this BBC does not have the required code. working so this is a bit weird so what I've just done is I've got the DFS ROM then I've got the ROM from the MMC card in as well and putting in the MMC cards ROM chip has made it work so I wonder if The MMC chip has got a newer ROM inside it. So let's just try something. Because I took that out thinking I didn't need it because I'm not using the MMC anymore. But let's see if it also has a DFS that works with the disk drive. Right, so we've got that. It says tube. Right, so that doesn't have any of the disk stuff. Okay, so I need both ROMs. Beep. Icon DFS, right. So we've got Elite loaded in. And has it selected that because it know it exists? Yeah, there we go. Ooh, yeah, that's working better, isn't it? Look at that. There we go. So this is with the 65C02 or 6502. Look at that, that's much nicer. Yeah, okay, this is working now. Right, how do we get DOS working? That's what I want. Start FX, oops. No, that didn't do anything to it. Star FX, 151230,8. I think that's how we do that. Yeah, 286 with 960k of RAM and a disk fault. I don't quite know what I'm loading here either. Watch this. Is this where I don't have the right chip to do the disk drive? FX 151230. My machine now thinks it has a Z80 inside it. This is pretty cool, actually. You know, this is a Raspberry Pi, which is getting slightly warm now because it's having to work quite hard to emulate a Z80 at speeds fast enough that the BBC thinks that there's actually a real one attached to it. And then I'm emulating a disk drive with some more things. You can tell that this machine was designed to be messed with like this. Like, it works quite nicely with its lid off. I just lift the keyboard out of the way and the ROM chips are just down here and I can easily pull them out. And then it's got so many connectors on the bottom that you can plug all sorts of things into. So what can we do with the Z80? Can we get CPM? Let's just recap where we're up to since 
we've done quite a few different bits and pieces and I'm kind of losing the plot with what I've done. I've managed to put a replacement floppy drive emulator inside an original enclosure. This now works as if it was a disk drive. And then I've managed to attach a Raspberry Pi to a nice little adapter board. And this is now pretending to be a second processor. Right, if I want it to be a Z80 so I can run CPM. All I apparently need to type in is star fx and five one two thirty. Go off. Oh. Right. So it's changed screen resolution now says tube Z eighty sixty four K. So if I now type in CPM because I've inserted the CPM disk. We're now in this. So now my BBC is no longer running BBC Basic. It's now running CPM. And it's at this point that I could go back to doing all the various CPM things I was doing before. So I've got like three or four disks of CPM stuff here. So there we are. It now it does something. It functions. However, um, if I break out of this and go into FX. 151, 238. It now thinks it's got a 286 with 960k of RAM. So now, in theory, I could run DOS on my BBC Micro. The only issue is that if I find the disk image for it, it's listed here as a different disk format which if I try and insert it and then do a catalogue it doesn't know what to do and this is all because I need to upgrade the disk drive so you can see it's a disk fault so inside the BBC just about here is the disk drive controller chip and it's the original one this is a 8271, which does single-sided and double-sided five and a quarter inch discs. It doesn't seem to do anything else. So what I needed to get, which is in this lovely pink bag, is an upgrade board. So what this does is it replaces this chip with this one, and there's a new ROM as well. I'll take out these two ROMs and swap it with that. To make this work, I needed a disk drive. That's my disk drive. But then it turns out that to make this work properly, I need this. So we're doing quite a lot of updates to my wonderful BBC. Right then, I've been reading the instructions and there's a variety of things I need to do to this board to make the controller work. So I'll just go through what I need to do. I've removed the keyboard, unplugged the power cable, so that bit's gone. The next thing I need to do is Locate link S9, which is this here, and if there's a link in there, it needs to be cut. Well, there isn't, so that's fine. Need to locate IC 79 and 80, which are here, and if they're fitted, that's fine. If they're not fitted, they gave me two, so I've now got two 7438s going spare. I need to remove the 8271, which is this one. If a socket is fitted at IC86, which is this one here, I need to remove the chip. Otherwise, I need to desolder this chip because we're going to jump two of the legs together. Now, there's two ways of doing this in the instructions. I can either desolder it and put a socket in, or I can snip the legs off the chip and just solder two of them together. I'm going to try and desolder the chip because I like the idea of there being a socket there and not the remnants of a chip that I've snipped off. But I am quite mindful that this board is very old and I don't want to damage any of the tracks. So we'll see how this goes. Here's the board from the BBC. It came out with moderate fuss. I had to cut off the um, composite connector, but never mind, I'm using RGB. What I need to do is remove that chip just there. And that's the next thing to do. After a fair amount of um, destructive removal, the chip is out. I don't think it'll ever work again. Which is a bit of a shame. I was trying to re 
use it, but it just wouldn't desolder. I could start to smell the PCB getting warm, and that's usually a hint that I'm about to start lifting traces. So I hacked off all its legs, brutally removed it, and fitted a socket nice and neatly. The other side of the board, it's all nice and cleany cleany. Next step, see if I've killed it. It's fine, we have a missing screw. They always give you too many anyway. So now, we take out some chips. Very carefully, without throwing them across the room. We'll start with the MMC chip, because that one. There we go, and you popped out nicely. DFS chip. This drive controller. Ooh, that came out very cleanly. According to the instructions, we put this here. Uh, all the pins are in the sockets. Gentle pressure. In. Now we get the... There we go. So we have the ROM, we have the new board. We need a keyboard next. Here's the machine, all assembled. It has its ROM in it, the new one. It's got the new disk drive controller. I hooked everything else back up. Let's turn it on, see what happens. Oh, let's turn the wall on first. Acom 1770 DFS. That sounds like the thing we're after. Okay. Now we need to plug in all the bits of hardware that I just disconnected before. How long is it going derp? I'm not turning on at all. What have I done? I'll plug the video cable in, that's what I've not done. It's a bit misleading, it doesn't do the second beep when it's got the tube connected. That's a star FX. One, two, thirty, eight. There we are, there's a 286. Be quiet. It's a bit strange that I can emulate a 286 at like the signal level using a little Raspberry Pi. Right, so it seems I need to burn an EEPROM with the ADFS ROM on it since I have DFS, so I can't read some of the disk images that I've got. I've got a Mini Pro EEPROM writer burner thing and I just need to make that work. So here we are on this fantastic Chinese website. I'm fairly sure it's legitimate. It's got the same words on it as the EEPROM writer. Let's find out. I have no idea if this is the correct piece of software. Yes, please translate to English. What does that say? Your network is abnormal and you need to verify. Oh, okay. Download immediately. Let's run this mystery binary. No, no, I, I, I don't think we'll, we'll run that. It's possibly the correct thing, but no. Let's try and find where we're supposed to get this from instead of here. I'll go buy some wine. No, let's not do that. XGECU.com. Okay, maybe it was the correct thing, because I went on here before. I clicked on this, and that took me to there, so okay. Ooh, let's install an unsigned driver. Oh, it's signed, I guess. Fair enough. So we're flashing the flashes firmware. So that I can flash firmware to a chip in the flasher. What have we got in here? IBM compatible BIOS. It's a Diamond Stealth 3D BIOS chip, so we've read out of that. Hurrah! Okay, the next step is to find the ADFS ROM and write all over it. Right, Acorn DFS, got you. Acorn ADFS. Open desktop. ADFS. No, I think it's binary. DFS 1.3, Acorn. 
Oh, icon ADFS, right. Device. Program. Program. Programming failed. Maybe this isn't an EEPROM. Maybe this is a mask ROM. And I can't actually do anything to it. And it's finished. So, what have I managed to do? Well, let's start from the beginning. So, first I had the idea of fitting a GoTech into the case of a disk drive, and that seemed to go quite nicely. This was actually the easiest thing that I did in all this little palaver. This just turned into the project that never wanted to end. Every time I tried to do something, I needed something else, and then something else, then a thing broke, and I had to buy some more stuff, and yeah, there's just lots of stuff. So, I've got the disk drive, the GoTech works, and then I discovered on it those disk images that didn't work because I didn't have a good enough disk controller. So, this is the old one, 8271. I then bought this upgrade here, which, as you saw, required me to completely mutilate a poor little IC. And then I tried to run the PyTube board, which tries to pretend to be a various mass coprocessors, and... I discovered that I didn't have the right ROM in the system, so I managed to bodge in a different ROM, and that sort of worked. But then I wanted to turn this into a 286 and run DOS, because why not? It's a BBC Micro. Clearly it needs to run DOS. But I didn't have the right ROM in the system either. I needed ADFS and not DFS, which is nothing to do with sofas. So I needed to get an EEPROM, and I thought, well, and a slight jump cut there because my camera's battery went flat mid Yep. So, anyway, as I was saying, I thought I could write it to an EEPROM, but it turns out that this is a one-time programmable one, which, when you realise it, is a bit obvious. It's got no little window, and it's not a flash chip. So then I thought, well, I'll just get an EEPROM. I've got some lying around, and it turns out that you have to embrace it using UV light, which again is obvious when you try. And I tried all sorts of horrendous things to try and erase this, before eventually giving in and buying possibly the most dangerous thing I own. But this large dose of ultraviolet radiation is harmful. And this gives out quite a lot. It gives out this really nice sort of greeny blue glow. Look at that wonderful slight sort of turquoise light coming out of it. It's, it's completely harmful. You know, you don't want to look at that. I got this, which used to contain a ROM for the old MMC cartridge. And what I did was stick it in that thing for far too long to the point where this is so blank you can't write data to it even the chip id is blank so i had to find another eprom and what i have lying around in my box of spares is this massive jammer board which yes i know i've just stolen an eprom off it but it's it's nothing special a very hacked and messed around with bootleg of street fighter 2 that doesn't really work because they've done something to the connector to make it work on a standard arcade machine and you can't really play the game but it does have lots of nice EEPROMs on it you'll notice that the EEPROM is in one piece and hasn't been cut in half by me trying to extract it from this board I discovered my ability to desolder has improved quite a lot just because I really needed the chip so there we have an EEPROM and by the way don't worry that this little window is open I've discovered that these are quite resistant devices you can't really accidentally erase them I shone lights at it, I shone a laser at it Shone some UV nail polish curing things at it. It didn't do anything. 25 minutes inside a Chinese UV light thing totally destroys them though. Five minutes, it wipes it. So what have I managed to do with all this? Well, here we go. So here we go. Let's turn it on. And it comes up saying Acorn Tube with a 1770 DFS. So this is Elite running with a second processor. All looks very nice. There we go. 230.4. So there, we've now got a Z80 CPU plugged into the tube port apparently. We are now running CPM on a fake Z80 on my BBC Micro. 
So I could now, in theory, take some of the code from the CPM on my RC2014 and run it on this, which sounds like a fun thing to do in the future. It thinks it has a 286 attached to it. To get this working as a PC, I first need to change from DFS to ADFS, which I think I do control A and break. Now I've got ADFS, and now it should start to boot. You'll notice it says Master, Master 512, even though this is a BBC Model B. I think I've put so many things inside this now that it is effectively almost a BBC Master. Don't care what the date and time is. Oops. But there, we have DOS Plus version 2.1. And what is DOS Plus? Well, it's a DOS compatible operating system. This now thinks it's a PC running on a 286. Are there any Atari ST owners out there? This looks slightly familiar if you ever owned one. I think if I'd seen this on a BBC back in the 80s when I saw these things, this would have like completely amazed me. I don't have a mouse though, so I can't control this. I'd need to somehow get a mouse working. And there is an analog port at the back that I could use, but I'd need to figure out how to wire one up. And there we go. So now my little, well, not very little, but huge project with my BBC is complete. I've managed to stuff a Raspberry Pi into it, added a GoTech, destroyed some ROM chips, which was fun. Learned all sorts of things about writing them, learned how to desolder without doing this to a chip anymore. Uh, sorry there, I'm never going to do that to you again, or anyone else similar to you. And now I've got the user port free, so now I can plug things into it. Turn this into a 1980s Arduino. So, if you like this video, maybe there's more things you want to go and watch. Uh, press a thumbs up thing, because that'll tell YouTube to send this to more people like you. And I'll see you in the next video. See you later.